This is the Mooks and the Gripes podcast. This is Trevor Barrett. I've been on here before in other iterations, but today I am joined by my good friend, Paul. Paul, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hey, Trevor, this is Paul Wilson. Um, I am excited to be on with you today. I, we were talking a little bit ahead of time, and it's really cool because I've known you for so long online, but it's great to actually get a chance to do this with you. Really looking forward to it. And I've been a big fan of you and your your blog and your podcast for years now. So yeah, thanks so much for this opportunity. Well, I, I appreciate it. I, I've been, I, I, I like podcasting. I, I know there are a lot out there, uh, but I was hoping for a conversational podcast, you know, try something, try something a little different from what I'm used to. And uh, so just for, for listeners sake, and Paul, I know I told you probably wouldn't do too much of this, but no. I reached out to Paul because I so much have enjoyed our conversations over the years. As Paul said, we've known each other for a decade, probably more, uh, it, more. really due to old palimpsest days. Yeah. Um, that was, that was some time ago now, <laughs> but yeah, I think my here we now go. 16 year old was probably, you know, in diapers <laughs> at that point. So yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> Uh, but we are going to have a fun conversation today, just different little sections, uh, conversations about books. Sometimes we might talk a little bit about film. Uh, we don't know. We're just looking forward to chatting and hopefully giving some good uh, reading uh, recommendations, maybe some fun conversations about about, about these things. Um, and let's let's begin paul one thing we're gonna do is really piggyback on the backlisted thing and start these with uh what have you been reading (laughs) yeah absolutely so i've had a good little stretch here the last couple weeks so at the beginning of the month i finished finally speaking of kind of our our theme today a little bit bucket list books i had had my eye on warlock by oakley hall Mm -hmm. that nyrb classic for for years now and along with a couple of other people on Twitter, we kind of got organized and decided to just do a reading group with that. Um, so I finished that up earlier earlier this month, and it was just excellent. Really, really good. It's kind of a take on, you know, the whole situation in Tombstone, Arizona. It's playing with a lot of, like, the myths of Westerns, but it really turns a lot of them on their heads. Um, you know, so it gets into a lot of the complexities of justice, what that means, there's no white hats and black hats by any means. It's definitely very complicated. And uh, so anyways, that was really, really good. Uh, and then I've kind of just gone through a streak of a few real short books that have all been really good, actually. Um, Simple Passion by <laughs> Annie Erno. I don't know if mm-hmm. you read anything by her. Um, I haven't yet. Yeah. I kept seeing her, you know, talked about and, and reviewed very highly. And this is a, a really excellent, it's like 50 some pages, but really good about a love affair that she went through. Um, and then one of my other favorites that I've read recently is Difficult Light by Tomas Gonzalez. It's an archipelago book. Um, it's uh, an older man who is kind of, it jumps back and forth between him now and then goes back to his youth when he was dealing with a very difficult stretch in his life. And it talks a lot about, you know, just art and how that has helped him get through and loss and different things like that. So it's it's a very, very well-written book. So anyway, those are a few I've been hitting on lately. Like I said, I've had a really good streak going. Well, I'm glad you you finished uh, Warlock. That one is a blind spot for me too. I can look right now and see it over on my shelf. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I need to pull it down. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, How about you though? Yeah. So on my end, I I have been, um, I've also had a pretty good reading month. Uh, One of them is a book that I'll try and talk about later on in the year. It doesn't come out until the end of the year, but I, I do want to bring it up so people start getting it on their radar. It's Pat Barker's The Women of Troy. Mm. Um, a few years ago, she published uh, The Silence of the Girls, which was a, a kind of a a take on the the Iliad, but from the perspective of Briseis, the the kind of you know the the woman at the at the heart of that particular conflict between Achilles and Agamemnon. Um, and I loved that book. I love I love these Greek stories, but I do think that a lot of these retellings eh, they don't mm-hmm. always work for me because I'm like oh, that doesn't really add to the epicness or or anything like that. I, I didn't I did not like the Song of Achilles because I kind of thought I think this is getting a lot of their culture wrong, um, you know, and things like that. I I don't know. I no I'm no expert or anything in in those fields, but the, this one did it for me. Having someone um, talking about what it's like to be a a queen and then a slave and then um, a concubine, 
and and I think doing it from what what I would say is a pretty culturally um, apt perspective. You know, she's brutalized and she knows it, but it's also told from a this is how the world is, uh, which I think is kind of an interesting way to do that. And I loved that that book. Well, the women of Troy happens after the sack of Troy, so you know Achilles is dead, um, and it still follows Briseis around as she tries to deal with all of these women who have survived while their husbands, sons, babies have all been killed because they didn't want to leave any male um, uh, Trojan uh, alive. And I thought it was fantastic as well. So have that on your radar. I just finished that one earlier in the month. And yeah, then absolutely. and then as kind of a different different style, I've been going through the Dresden Files by Jim Butcher. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> have you heard of these? I've heard of them, but I've not. I don't I'm not real familiar. I I always so I'm enjoying them. And I don't want to seem like I'm ashamed. No. But I don't necessarily always know how to introduce them to people who say, hey, what are you reading? Right. Well, it's this kind of detective series, with, but the detective is a wizard and he's fighting vampires. <laughs> and it's like, well, what are you doing? And, and they're fun and they, they do grow. There's there's kind of an epic scope to the to the mythology in, in, in these books that I'm really enjoying. And I just finished one of those on Friday, maybe yesterday or the day before. I can't remember. Nice. Um, no, so absolutely that's, that's been be fun embarrassed about there because i i agree like sometimes <laughs> yeah i think we both gravitate towards you know a lot of heavier books or you know translated yeah. fiction and all that stuff but at the same time like i i in the same way i enjoy sometimes just lightening it up and just reading something just for fun so no those sound good yeah it's been a, it's been covid right i mean there, there are some things that are that are great for that and and i've and i really have liked them so i'm i'm curious if people have have picked these up or if they you know oh a, a wizard private detective that sounds hokey <laughs> well it is hokey and i think the series knows that and has a little bit of fun with that but mm-hmm. anyway anyway yeah, that, that was book 5 there's like a billion of them <laughs> hey it's good so. to always have plenty <laughs> ahead of you if you want them you know <laughs> yeah um and then a poetry collection i finished uh, jack spicer's after lorca that's coming out from NYRB Poets. That was amazing, Paul. I didn't know how I would uh, uh, feel about it, but Jack Spicer's writing it about 20 years after Lorca has died. But Lorca writes the foreword, (laughs) Mm. you know, at the invitation of Spicer. And it's very clever and playful. But what Spicer has done is he's kind of recast several of Lorca's poems. He calls them new new translations. But they're, they're not. They're... They're tweaks there, and it's really fascinating to see the things that he adds or, or subtracts from these poems. The, it it was it was a really fun read because every once in a while Spicer will have a letter to um, to Lorca, and then we'll uh, talk about his thoughts on poetry. And those are kind of brilliant just in and of themselves. But the poetry was a lot of fun too. So, so that's, that's what I've been, uh, been reading. I've, I've taken up too much time. You should always feel comfortable to just ramble on for a second, uh, if you're having oh, fun no. with it. So <laughs> absolutely. No, that sounds great. I, poetry is one of those areas where I love it, but I do feel like it's a bit of a blind spot for me. And so I've been, I always welcome any kind of recommendations for one thing. And also I've been trying to kind of push myself, um, to just, you know, try some, just not be intimidated and just go for it. So, you know, I think I might've told you in the past, I've read recently, there's a collection called Braided Creek. That's Hmm. by uh, Jim, Jim Harrison, and then uh, Ted Kuzer. And it's kind of a conversation in poetry between the two of them. um, That's really fascinating. You don't actually even know, basically they send each other postcards with poems on them back and forth over the course of like a year. And they don't even specify who wrote which poem. Hmm. So you move back and forth and it's just, it's about aging. It's about nature. It's about all these different things. So yeah, that was one that I came across recently that kind of got me inspired to really continue to, to explore poetry because there's just so much out there and so much variety, you know? Well, and it's National Poetry Month still. I don't know when we'll post this because it might take a bit to get things, you know, set up and all of that. But um, that's been a good month to rediscover some old favorites. I have been posting on Instagram some of my favorite uh, poetry collections that I uh, have kind of rediscovered over the month. So yeah, maybe we'll have to we'll have to I'll follow up on this with you sometimes, Paul. I'll say, How, how's have you read any good poetry lately? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> if the no, answer is no, then that's that's fine. <laughs> uh, you know, um, 
All right. Well, well, thanks for that. That was fun. And, and we, we do talk on Twitter a lot, but it's fun to get a little bit more, a little bit more in depth and maybe a little more animated. Yeah, <laughs> about absolutely. Some of these yeah. things. Exactly. But our main topic today that we wanted to kind of discuss a, a way of getting to know you through the things you have not done <laughs> or the, the, or better yet, the, the books you have not read. This is our bucket list uh, books. And um, I think we've each put together f- a list of five uh, books yeah, that roughly, have been on roughly our, five. Yeah. So when you went, you know, we just kind of called it the bucket list um, book and we went off on our separate ways to, to fill up, fill that out. However, we saw fit. Um, what were some of the things you had in your mind as you considered what is a bucket list book for me? What, what were the criteria that you were uh, thinking of? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So uh, it's interesting because I have noticed as I start to get a little older, you know, I'm not too old yet, but mm-hmm. as I wrote, reached 40 or so and then kind of passed there, I started to notice that there were a lot of these books that I was just pushing down through the years, like, oh, I'll get to that. I was waiting for the perfect time or that's not a good fit right now, but maybe I'll get to it soon. And over the last few years, I've kind of reached this conclusion of like, you know, why not now? Um, I think part of that might've been prompted by the pandemic. You know, there's a lot more time where you were just at home. And I was thinking to myself, you know, there's never going to be a better time to just start digging into some of these books that maybe you've been putting off for that perfect time. So, you know, over the last year of the pandemic, I've, um, read Ulysses, which had been on my list Mm -hmm. forever. And then I also went ahead and just kind of dug into Proust and made my way through that pretty slowly, but it was, it was absolutely fabulous. And so I think for me, it was this idea of, you know, you can keep putting things off, but at a certain point, like, why not just start going for it and enjoying these books? So, um, you know, I I was actually listening to this audio book of a um, book that was called the writer's library. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's by Nancy Pearl and Jeff Schwager. Mm -hmm. And basically they're going around and it's a series of interviews with different authors, just focusing on their reading life and and kind of the works that have influenced them. And so one of the um, interviews, the guy says, you know, I'm 55 now. I just read a series of novels that were front and center in the public conversation. And I found myself underwhelmed. Around the same time, I happened to read a book by Harold Bloom called Where Shall Wisdom Be Found? And so in this book, Bloom, who was in his 70s at the time, asks himself, you know, after this extraordinary lifetime of reading, in what books did he actually find wisdom? Um, So for Bloom, wisdom is gained, is gaining some command over the quandaries of being human. So I just thought that was really interesting. Um, And so this interviewed, the guy says, you know, the book had a big effect on him. And so he thinks I'm turning 40. If I live to 80, and read one book a month very carefully where I underline and reflect upon what I've read and write down my thoughts. That means I've just got 480 books left. And so to me, it's not like (laughs) I don't have any kind of like counter going in my mind where I'm like, you know, panicking about how many books I've left or anything like that. But it just kind of drove home that whole point of like, you know, there's a lot of value in just starting to really focus on those books that you really want to read. There's a lot of books out there like we just discussed that are just fun and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Um, But to a certain degree, like if there's a book that's been on your shelf, just pick it up and, and start digging in. So that was kind of my thought is just what are these books like whenever someday I come to the end of my life? What are these books where I think it's really important that I will have read them? So that was just my long winded answer to kind of your question. Yeah, no, I, I, I like that. And I really like that quote. Mm-hmm. You've got me thinking, OK, let's see what books do I need to, <laughs> to yeah. prioritize? But um, last year, from 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 my side, I, I read finally, and I actually listened to it because Andy Miller himself reads it. But it's Andy Miller's uh, "The Year of Reading Dangerously," which he talks about on Backlisted Pod. Um, it's fantastic. I mean, and I loved listening to it. If you can get a hold of the audiobook, I I do recommend that just because I think he is a great raconteur. I mean, he can tell yeah. great stories. He can. He's got a way of delivering. Um, and in that, he had put together a list of betterment, you know, his 50 books that he wanted to read and um, went through it. And I, I did the same thing then. It took me a long time. I think I even previewed on Twitter, hey, I'm putting together my list of betterment. And I think you, Paul, were one who said, oh, I'm excited to see that. Absolutely. Well, like six months later, <laughs> I finally <laughs> put it up. And that was a lot of fun to put together. Uh, and to have that goal of of kind of a horizon that I could look at and say, I am excited for these books. I don't know if I'm going to enjoy all of them. And that's actually something that, uh, I, again, I, 
I put it up and I said, Hey, look, Andy Miller, I, I, I put together my own list of betterment. Mm -hmm. And he said something that I I quoted in my blog post, but I can't remember uh, word for word, but something along the lines of, oh, have fun with this. Enjoy it. Even the books you don't. And just that sense of, yeah, there's something about, you know, having some of these books that you are, you're reading because it's, it's not a chore. It's not work. It's humanity. And it's an, an effort to get to know some things. Maybe I won't like them all on all kinds of levels, but there's a sense of, of progression and, and joy in that. So I put together 50 books, um, but I actually looked at this quite differently, these bucket list books. I tried to look at my shelves and say, what are some books that have been there that I have been kind of jumping up and down for years and years and years that I have not pulled down yet? Maybe because of a sense of, oh, I I want to save that for what? I don't know. <laughs> or I want to... Um, uh, get to that on, on a day when I'm not so distracted. And I just, uh, that, I don't know if that will ever happen. Uh, but it's, it's time to, to look at some of these. And so some of them are on my list of betterment, but some of them aren't. Um, and I I was also inspired by a Tom, Tom, you can find him at Hogglestock, Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, on Twitter. He he used to do the, the, um, readers, the readers podcast, Mm -hmm. kind of an inspiration for why we wanted to just have a conversational book podcast, you and me, Paul. Um, uh, but Tom, uh, put, posted a, uh, a video of, uh, I don't even remember who it was, but doing kind of a library, personal library tour, you know, his book stacks. And in there he pulls out, uh, uh, Thomas Mann's Buttonbrooks and says, ah, Buttonbrooks, I haven't read this one yet. Good still have it to look forward to. And just that sense of joy that, oh, I can, there's, there's a world in here that I'm excited to get to know. And so I try to figure out what are some books that have been jumping up and down that I'm really excited about the world I will get to know in there Mm -hmm. to some extent anyway. Yeah, so absolutely. No, I I think that's exactly right. It's that feeling of joy and anticipation. Um, Like you said, it's not like you're naive enough to think that every single one of these is going to turn out to be your favorite book ever. But in some ways, like, more and more as I get older, I kind of appreciate even the ones that aren't mm-hmm. your favorites. It's just like kind of the struggle of dealing with some difficult books and then getting through it or not getting through it and just what you learn. And I don't know, it's just that whole process of growing as a reader. So yeah, mm-hmm. I think that excitement and anticipation is a lot of what I'm feeling as we look through these lists. Well, and I I, I do think too that there there's a bit of, um, there's a, a skill or a facility to be to be gained by starting up one of these books and finishing it. Uh, it's a hurdle. It's a physical barrier at times that, uh, it's easier to do something else. It's easier to, to read a different book even, or to get on social media. And not all of my books are like big, thick, difficult, you know, world, uh, altering books. A few of them are quite small. Mm -hmm. Um, but it can still be daunting. And to get that uh, skill of, I'm going to start this book that's been in men in some way, intimidating me mm-hmm. and I'm going to finish it. And I find that once I get into a rhythm, I can do that easier. I can do that better. And if, it, so I'm, I'm hoping that I can kind of do that. Yeah. Um, well, and you and, mentioned distraction, you know, and, and more and more, as we all know, there's plenty of that around. And so one of the, one of the things I've noticed, like, like I said, when I actually did make my way through a few of these books that have been on my list for so long is as you start to dig in and get immersed in them, there's just this feeling of it's almost like meditation or calm where, Mm -hmm. you know, you you put away your phone and you're just sitting there and you're spending, you know, if you can an hour or two hours, whatever, just kind of immersing yourself. And then when you finish this book, it's been this, this journey and there's just something very uh, fulfilling about it, I guess, you know, and like helpful. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's a mental health aspect to being able to, to get into the flow with a, with a Mm -hmm. book. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, no, sorry, so, I interrupted yeah. you. <laughs> no, no, that's exactly what I was what I was aiming for. And just like I said, the word meditation comes up. But for me, like I don't, I don't personally meditate or anything. But I think if I don't spend some time deeply immersed into a book, you know, as often as I can, I think that does form a kind of meditation for me. Where if I don't do it, I can I can feel that I'm not as mentally well as I would otherwise mm-hmm. be. So yeah, there's yeah. a lot to it for sure. Yeah, no, those are great points. Well, let's get to it then. Um, did you rank these? Or are we doing this? I, I did not, just so you I know. I just either. have a list and it came to mind and I put it down. Why well, no, don't we same. hear however you want to present um, your, your first book? What, what do you got there? Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off hot and heavy. Um, you know, like <laughs> I said, I had 
kind of been chopping away at a few of these, like some of my favorite books ever, Moby Dick, you know, Ulysses, Mm -hmm. Proust. It's not that I'm like, just because they're highbrow, but I do think there's a reason that they're, they've stuck around and that there's so much value still placed on them. And so the first book that came to mind for me that I've been meaning to read for so long is Don Quixote. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, for many reasons, it's such a foundational text. You know, if you're a reader, it comes up. I feel like, you know, once you start paying attention, it's like this book comes up in practically every book you read, at least in passing or, you know, an allusion to it or something like that. And so it's just such a seminal text. Um, And then, you know, I think also what appeals to me about it is the humor and the companionship that I know exists in there. And so I, you know, my wife read it a couple of years ago and she was just sitting over there, you know, chuckling and, (laughs) you know, it took her quite a while to make her way through it. But at the same time, she was saying how amazed she was that it was, you know, pretty much a page turner in some sections. And so, you know, it's just been kind of building up in my mind, like, again, with this whole idea of if not now, when, so, you know, I don't want to put too much pressure on myself, but I'm thinking by the end of the year, (laughs) maybe around the holidays or something, I might pick that one up when I have some good stretches of uninterrupted time. So, yeah, that's the first one for me that that I kind of have my eye on. How I've never you? read I've never oh, read yeah, Don Quixote. It um it's on my shelf too. I think my parents bought me a kind of a really nice hardback edition mm-hmm. uh, when I was in college and I've uh, I've I mean I've opened like the front cover to look at the text a little bit, mm-hmm. but I've never I've never done it. It's in, it's it's intimidating to me. Oh, me too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, but you have a way of inspiring me to do, to do some of these. I, I'll give you my number one. Okay. There, and this is definitely if I didn't rank them, but this would be my number one. Mm-hmm. I the rest of these, I'm like, oh, I could probably die and and not be too upset at myself <laughs> for yeah. not having read them. But this one is one that I think will speak to me in some way that I I de- definitely want to have this experience. And you brought it up already. It's a Proust. It's the remembrance mm-hmm. of things past or in search of lost time, whichever, whichever way you want to put it. Uh, I've had, I, I've had this book uh, ready to read since college. You know, it's been mm-hmm. a few decades now that I've been thinking, Oh, the day will come. And that is kind of my, uh, Thomas Mann, Buddenbrook. So mm-hmm. good. I still have that to look forward to. I am very excited about it, but boy, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm scared too. Cause I have sat down to say, okay, this is the year. Mm-hmm. And I just don't, don't do it. You know, I'm like, oh, t- and tomorrow is the day, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. uh, it just doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, and uh, I don't want to sound sycophantic, but on backlisted again, they did an episode on Proust a uh, mm-hmm. year or two ago. And Andy Miller read the first paragraph, but he didn't do it in the Lydia Davis translation, which I have and have been kind of like, oh, I really love Lydia Davis and her translations. They did it in kind of the old, you know, combined translation. And the depths and details in those kind of twisty, arcane passageways. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was so drawn in. I have I have read that passage. I, I went and I said, oh, I'm not reading Lydia Davis's translation now. I, I'm reading this one. Yeah. You know, there's a difference there. And um, I went and bought them all. So I have them. And that would be my number one. And I know you just just got through it all yourself. And that was inspiring. And uh, you've had nothing but good things to say. In fact, uh, it, let me know if I'm interpreting this right. I mean, that seemed like uh, almost a religious experience for you when you like this was this was this is now a part of me. Oh, absolutely. You know, this, yeah. this book. No, for sure. It is. It's um, what you mentioned about the language. You know, it's, we talked earlier about how some of these are page turners. I would not say that this is a page turner, <laughs> although there are sections that are surprisingly quick. You know, I mean, I would find myself, you know, certain sections I would burn through, you know, 50 or 70 pages in a sitting, but there was also those other sections where it would be, you know, three or four pages in a sitting and take a lot of time. <laughs> so yeah, it is. It's just... It's hard to describe. It's such an immersive experience. It's so much about time and memory and it jumps around. And And one of the ways that I found that really worked for me to read it was just not to get bogged down. So just kind of let it wash over me. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I would just read along. And I mean, this is somewhat true of, of some of the other, you know, kind of difficult books like a Ulysses or something where I have found like if I get bogged down and I'm looking up every reference I don't understand and I'm trying to look up the history of whatever this might mean that they're talking about in the parlor, like 
it can kind of get intimidating and wear me down. And so, you know, a lot of times what I've found is just kind of go with the flow and let it wash over you. Um, and, and that seemed to work really well for, for Proust. And I will say, you know, there's a few books that, in the middle that aren't quite on the same level or maybe not on the same level, but they weren't quite the same to me as some of the other ones, but no, you're right. It was one of those experiences, what you said about it became a part of me. That's absolutely the way to put it. And it's funny because I think I posted something at the end, you know, on Twitter that I'd finished it or whatever. And I think that was like my most liked and commented <laughs> post that I've <laughs> ever done. And I think there's this feeling of like people, you know, I don't think it's like survivor syndrome by any means, but it's just like this, it's like a lot of these books, there's like this little club of like, Oh, you did it. Didn't you love it? And like, it's kind of this, it's like a very positive and kind of cool experience. Just like mm-hmm. you've made it to the other side and, and you can kind of share in this, like what a great experience this was. So yeah, yeah. I think you should definitely make it happen one of these days. I will. I will. I, w- I will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what's your next one? Yeah. My next one. So I have read and loved, well, loved might not be the right word, but you and I have even talked about Roberto Bolaño, 2666 mm-hmm. in particular. I know you did like a, a kind of a book club one year about it and I followed along. So I've read that one twice. Um, and so, you know, he's obviously amazing. He's a legend. So Savage Detectives is one that I have not yet read. Um, same thing. I've been kind of, ever since I finished 2666, I've been, had that one kind of earmarked as like, this is his other really big, well-known yeah. book. Um, you know, so same thing. It's like, after having read 2666, as much as I enjoyed it and there's no doubt that he's a master, you know, it's, it's hard work in a lot of ways for, for different reasons, both the reading and also sometimes the subject matter. Um, I know Savage Detectives is, is quite different in, in subject matter, but anyway, that's one that I've just been kind of keeping my eye on for a while now. Um, you know, I need to, there's other ones of his books that I'd like to read, like his short story collection, Last Evening on Earth, which I've just heard rave reviews mm. about, but Savage Detectives feels to me like right or wrong. Like it's kind of like sits right there with 2666 is the one that's revered by a lot of people. So I don't know. Have you read that one? No, no, I don't know. Um, it's the one I haven't. And it mm. really is because I'm trying to save it a little bit. Yeah. I, I just read his, the one that just came out, Cowboy Graves, mm-hmm. and really enjoyed that. It's so refreshing. It, it's a mess in some ways. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's clearly just a bunch of his kind of, oh, here, I just need to get down some stuff and, and write these documents. Uh, but he has a voice and a personality and a subject and, and these characters you get, you get back with Arturo Bellano, who's in like last evenings on earth and, and in the mm. Savage Detectives. But, but no, I have not read the Savage Detectives and I put a little footnote at the bottom that, you know, it's so nice to come back to Bolaño. Mm. I don't want to be done. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons I haven't read it, but it's, it's one that's on my list of betterment though, because I finally said, you know, I, I got to do it someday. Yeah. Um, it probably could have been a, a, a book on, uh, on my list here too, because it is, it certainly is one that I, I've had it since it came out. I mean, I remember the hubbub about it. And then mm-hmm. I remember when 2666 came out, I have that really fun um, kind of cardboard box set that FSG put out. Um, oh, cool. in the three volumes not not the one solid hardback mm-hmm. and yeah i i adore that. and i've read it twice too 2666 yeah. well, and honestly could go for another one uh, that's what i was just about to say the crazy <laughs> thing is like it's so huge and some of the like the section about the women you know it just like oh, you yeah. feel like you've been you know gone through the ringer after you finish that section and so it, it's not what you would think of as one that you just want to keep reading but yeah i mean that book haunts me. I, I think about reading it again and it hasn't been that many years since I reread it, maybe two or three. Um, so yeah. So anyway, Bolaño in general is somebody that I need to explore a lot more. Cause I think I've read 2666 and I've read one other one, which I am not remembering the name of right now, but there's so much more to explore to your point of, yeah. you know, and they're, they're kind of crazy. Did, did you, did you ever have much interaction with Kevin from Canada? Kevin I Peterson? did not not a ton, but I definitely was aware of him, and we did have some conversations. Yeah, so you know, his strong personality, mm-hmm. um, and, and it was a very sad day when he died. Uh, now it's been several, uh, you know, it's been several years now. But um, but he got after me once for Bologna. <laughs> Just one of these. The emperor has no clothes, and mm. and I'm like, uh, nope. I'm sorry. You know, I can totally see where you're coming from. This is not something where I expect everybody to have the same priorities or or you know, the same things come out of it and that's totally fine. But this person who can write about pointlessness Mm -hmm. with such 
purpose. Um, you know, vague paranoia with such direct fear is it's it's brilliant. And so, yeah, I, I it's a journey. It's a labyrinth. It's a nightmare, but right. it's definitely one that is somewhat thrilling too. It's invigorating at the same time that it's mm-hmm. uh, terrifying. So yeah, no, exactly. And I just remembered the the other one of his that I've read, but I I need to reread it because I honestly don't have a really strong recollection of it. Is by night in Chile. Oh, I love that one. I've read I that know. one several times. <laughs> that's the thing is like I know it's another one that's beloved, and and so you know how sometimes you'll read a book and maybe it's just not the right time or for whatever reason. It wasn't uh-huh. that I didn't like it by any means because I remember liking it a lot, but I just don't have a lot of recollection. So mm-hmm. again, that whole, I have that to look forward to. That's another one. Yeah. Another a reread to look yeah, forward exactly. to. <laughs> well, so my next one is, it, it, I, I'm kind of cheating here, but I guess I cheated with the remembrance of things past too, since I, that's like how many books? Uh, Five seven. or six, seven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm now going to put up two. <laughs> oh, that's okay. It's these two. Can you see them there on your Ooh, screen? The Stones of Aaron, uh, mm-hmm. Pilgrimage, and then Labyrinth. And these are pretty thick books um, that NYRB Classics has put out from written by Tim Robinson. I don't know a whole lot about him other than it sounds right up my alley. Someone who is inspired by the landscape around him mm-hmm. goes and delves in deeply. And, uh, you know, cartographically almost, but also with a lot of human, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming existence kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. It, it, it has a, uh, when I read about it, it, it reminds me of what I feel about Lauren Isley's work that, um, uh, you know, that great nature and cosmic uh, uh, r- poet and writer, you know, he wrote, he wrote nonfiction nature works, but they, they have the resonance of, you know, deep philosophical poetry and I get the sense that these might be, maybe I'm completely wrong, but somewhere yeah. there, you know, yeah. never read them. They're on my bucket list, but they're big too. And again, oftentimes I'll look at them on the shelf and think, is this, is this the time? And I go, I, I don't think so. And not because I don't want to read them, but because I, you know, I almost want like the, the time. And I, I you know, again, this is never going to come when I can go spend a month in a cottage somewhere exactly. <laughs> undisturbed, then I'll take these with me for sure. Uh, but I do need to figure out how to how to mine out that time just in my normal day to day life for for Proust, but also for these uh, the stones of stones of Aaron. Yeah. He died a, a year or two ago, and a lot of people kept bringing up how much these books mean to them. And I thought, man, I, I, it, I'm I'm on the right track. It's on my list. I just need to <laughs> need to do it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's funny. Um, you and I are definitely kindred spirits because that those two books were on my final list until maybe yesterday and then oh, really? <laughs> kind of swap them out. So later on, we talked about doing kind of a, you know, runners up or an honorable mention section. And those were definitely going to be on there because mm. what you described about that whole idea of, you know, I, I've gotten more and more into nature writing over the last few years and particularly that what you just described about finding one area and digging in really deeply to it. Um, Robert McFarlane, I don't know if you've read any of his stuff, but mm-hmm. he does that a lot really well. You know, obviously Annie Dillard, um, Edward yes. Abbey, I read Desert Solitaire and that book, there are some sections of that book where it just blew me away where he just, you know, the one in particular that I remember is him and his friend um, tubing down this river that is going to be dammed. So they're basically seeing a lot of this stuff for the last time that it's going to be not underwater. Hmm. And it was very elegiac and, and really well done. And so these ideas of, like you said, just picking one spot and kind of digging in and really focusing on it um, are fascinating to me. So yeah, Tim Robinson. And then one other one that comes to mind for me is, have you heard of Prairie Earth? It's by William Least Moon. It's Not that I know of. I don't yeah. think so. It's that same idea. And I, like you with uh, Tim Robinson, I don't know all the details of it, but I know that basically he picks this relatively small area of land in Kansas and he just digs in like it goes into like geology, it goes into history, it goes into, you know, social stuff that's happened there, you know, Native American history and, you know, atrocities and all of these things. And there's just something very fascinating about picking like a any any type of land, but especially something like in Kansas, where maybe it's just this stretch. If you drove by on the highway, you would never even think twice about it. But then somebody takes the time to kind of research and dig in deeply and just how much has happened there. So anyway, yeah, I'm all yeah. on board with with that that type of book. Oh boy, are we are we setting up a? We I, I don't have the goal of ever doing a, a 
book group on here. <laughs> right. But but that's a that's a candidate for that non-existent future thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I think we should we should put a little mark next to it for sure. <laughs> All right, what do you got next? So, this is one where I don't actually even know how much I'll be able to say about it, but it goes back to our poetry conversation. You know, there are those books that kind of exist You just know you need to read them at some point in your life, like we talked about. And so the complete poems of Emily Dickinson, um, I've, I got it probably five or six years ago. You know, I'm an English major, so it's not like I have not been exposed to Emily Dickinson. I definitely have, but probably at points in my life where maybe I didn't appreciate her as much as I should have. So, you know, I don't know that I'm going to sit down and just read it cover to cover, but what I've been doing with some of the bigger collections of poetry poetry recently is kind of move it over to my bedside table and just dip in and out, you know, like maybe you're reading a longer book, but you just each night, maybe you read a a poem or two. And so Mm -hmm. I've kind of had my eye on that just because again, she's one of those that's just so um, influential, so canonical, so seminal to so many other writers works. And, you know, the, the bits of her poetry that I have read have been, you know, just blown me away. So one of those where I don't know why I haven't gotten to it yet, but well, I'm ready to do it. Uh, this is one where I might say I envy that that you haven't done it yet, hmm. because what it, I think we all have, or I hope we all have, these reading memories, these special moments of almost transcendence with a book mm-hmm. or with a poem or something like that. Uh, I was I and I one was in my mind this week due to national poetry month. I posted on Billy Collins collection, picnic lightning. Mm. And I remember getting that assigned to me in a poetry class in the early two thousands, like 2001 or something like that. And thinking, Oh, this looks interesting. And sitting down at my desk at, I don't know, six or seven at night and not stopping. And I read the whole thing in one sitting and it was a beautiful experience. And then I turned, I read the whole thing again over the next uh, few days. I marked, I've marked those poems up a bunch. They're different. You know, it's, it's not like this is, I, I don't know. I don't want to, to sound down on Billy Collins, but he, he, these poems are special to me. Whereas I'm not necessarily all for like, Oh, he's the greatest poet ever. Right. Um, but uh, that was one of those special reading experiences. And I, I had a similar one when I did the complete works of Emily Dickinson. I, my, again, my parents, <laughs> they bought me one. I remember it was my, it was my birthday, probably even before Billy Collins. So, you know, 2000, something like that. And they got it for me. And I sat down over that summer and, and did read through those one by one. And I would uh, mark the ones that I really loved and reread them. And, oh uh, yeah, just, so much fun. And, and this kind of comes together again, because in, in Billy Collins' Picnic Lightning, there's a poem called uh, Taking Off Emily Dickinson's Clothes, a little mm. playful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I love it. It's it's There's something to it that brings to mind the power of her poetry um, that I can't quite put my finger on, because it's, it's a sensual poem. I mean, he's taking off Emily Dickinson's clothes, but there's something else to it. And, and it it brings up her, her poetry and her, you know, things that we know about her, at least feel about her, her life, you know, in Amherst, these Sabbath mornings and all these things, you know? (laughs) And yeah, so I, in a way I envy that, that this is uh, something that you've got in front of you. Um, Not to try and sound condescending, because that that can, I know that can sound that way. Like, oh, young boy, you have uh, <laughs> you you have got some experiences in front of you, uh, uh, I, which I have had, and it's <laughs> you know, therefore I'm so much wiser. It, it, I do mean that genuinely, though. Like, wow, that's that's fun, and I hope you I hope you enjoy it. Is is uh, and I hope I'm not over overselling Emily Dickinson. You know, <laughs> I don't think she's too too in danger of being oversold. But <laughs> right. no, I don't ever take it that way. In fact, I probably err on the other side where it's part of the reason my bookshelves are so packed and overflowing and don't look nearly as nice as yours do in the background. There is, um, <laughs> I, when people are enthusiastic about something, I am very susceptible to the, like catching on to that. Like it's contagious for sure. And so no, when I hear somebody who had an experience like that and it meant that much to them, if anything, it makes me more likely to, to rush out and buy it and then hopefully read it. Um, so uh-huh. no, that, that sounds great. Yeah. How about you? What's your, uh, what's your next one? My next one is one that you'll be able to talk about more than I will, because I know you've read it. 
And I know it's one of your favorite books. I think that you read last year. It's Gene Stafford's The Mountain Lion. Uh, yes. Uh, I've, I've, again, I've had this for a long time and it just sounds like a book, you know, there's childhood, there's, I believe nature. Mm -hmm. It's, it's got all those things that come together for me in, in what I'm assuming will be somewhat meaningful to me. And I just don't know why I resist those. It's like, oh, well, I'll, I want to read that soon. I'll go read another Dresden Files now, though, you know. <laughs> but but yeah, that one is on my on my list. And NYRB Classics is releasing another one of her books this later on this year. And it's I so I did an both the list of betterment of my fifty books, but I also did a supplementary NYRB Classics, the ten books I am going to read that mm. I've been meaning to read from NYRB Classics back back catalog. I'm going to read them in 2021, and the Mountain Lion is on it partly because I needed to get to it and, and finally do it, right. but also to be prepared for what they're releasing later on this year. Yeah, no, you're right. It's, that was one of my very, very favorite books I read last year. It's, I had the same thing. I'd had it on my list for a long time and, and kept kind of kicking it down the road. Um, but man, it is just so well done. And, and like you said, there's a lot of childhood involved, which sometimes can make me a little wary because when childhood narrators are done wrong, that's some of my least favorite books. Like I, it, they can be so bad. <laughs> and this one is just so perfect. It's, it encaptures, encapsulates the, um, you know, the magic of childhood, but also kind of like the confusion and kind of the way that a lot of times kids are just bluffing and kind of like making their way through life and, and playing off of all these things where they don't really know what's mm. going on, but they're just doing their best. And there's also a really interesting sibling relationship in there. Um, lots of nature, like you said, and, you know, you and I, I think both have an affinity for the West, the West of the United States. Um, and it definitely I captures thought about a lot introducing of the podcast of, I thought about introducing the podcast as from the Rocky mountains exactly. <laughs> or something like that. Cause <laughs> we're both, we're both in the Rocky mountains. Yeah. Uh, anyway, inter it interrupted no. you again. <laughs> no, no. It, yeah, exactly. And it, a big chunk of it does take place in the Rocky mountains. And I would like to think no matter you know, what my background is, because I was born and raised in Colorado. And so, you know, I think I definitely do resonate with books set in the West, but I would think that anybody, you know, regardless of that would, would get a lot out of this book. And like you said, I've had my eye on that new one that's coming out from NYRB. And it's funny, I just ordered, um, I, I believe it's FSG who put out her collected short stories. Um, and mm. I did not even have that on my radar. And so I'm pretty excited about that because I, I didn't I've either. Heard, yeah. So I've heard good things. So looking forward to that too. Huh. But yeah, I, I, I'll be curious to hear what you think of um, think of it because I'd be not to, again not to put pressure on you, but I'd be shocked if you didn't love it. I'll let you know. Um, it might be my next one. Uh, I'm reading The Enchanted April right now because it's April, and uh, and it's one of those books I'd been meaning to read. And I think the next one from my NYRB list of betterment might be The Mountain Lion. Right. Um, so May you know, something for me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, all right. What do you have? Uh, second to last one. Yeah. Well, at, at the risk of turning this into like a backlisted um, <laughs> sub podcast, <laughs> um, anatomy of melancholy. It was uh, already one that I had, you know, I had the NYRB, that beautiful edition with the skull on the front, you know, it's, it's been calling to me for a long time. Um, but again, talk about intimidating this book. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, size wise, even when you hear people who love it, they're all, they'll readily admit that it's not something you just pick up and, and burn your way through. It's something you dip in and out of. And, um, but yeah, there was a episode of backlisted on that book with Philip Pullman. And if anything, it just made me want to read it even more. And, and they were acknowledging all of the difficulty and, you know, some of it is like there's antiquated language or, you know, some of these sections that'll just dig into it, like go off on a rabbit trail. But just the more I hear about it, it sounds so fascinating and unlike anything that I've ever read before. And so, you know, again, I don't know when I will get to this one and it may be one that I need to treat kind of like one of those books of poetry where I keep it somewhere <laughs> and just, you know, read a few pages here and there. I don't know, but it does keep calling to me. Um, one of these days I'm going to get to it. And, you know, I think just everything about it qualifies is a bucket list book for me for sure I, I 
that's one that would be on my list too uh, if I'd really been thinking about this uh, deeply. I've never read it, mm-hmm. uh, but lots about it. I mean, you've got uh, Sabald's The Rings of Saturn, which brings up quite a bit of things from it and mm. um, in such a meaningful way. So uh, my next one is The Black Prince by Iris Murdoch. Um, I love Iris Murdoch's uh, books. I think she's a fantastic writer, and I've always heard that this was one of her best ones. Well, for Christmas one year, I thought, oh, I'll tell my wife to, to get me this one, The Black Prince, only she also wrote a book called The Green Knight. And for whatever reason, when I looked at the list, I thought, oh, there's The Green Knight. I'll ask my wife to get that one for me. And she gets it for me, and and I kind of read the premise, and I'm like, well, this doesn't sound like what people told me <laughs> The Black Prince was. And it's because, you know, I totally, totally messed that up. Well, I have since got a copy of The Black Prince, the nice Penguin Classics edition, and I still haven't read it. It was, I guess that was my time, you know, that Christmas I was going to read The Black Prince or this next Iris Murdoch, and that's been a decade or so Mm -hmm. ago. And so it's been sitting there for a long time. It's time I get back to Iris Murdoch, uh, because it's been a while since I dipped into her work. And she's one of those that I'm kind of like... Uh, in general, I'd like to read more of her of her stuff. So, so I put the the Black Prince on here, not the Green Knight, which I'll be honest, still haven't read either. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it's not the next Iris Murdoch for me. It's the Black right. Prince. No, <laughs> I know what you mean. You've got to stick to your guns on this stuff. No, I've I'm <laughs> vaguely familiar. I've read The Bell by her, and I loved it. I mm. thought it was really well done. And then recently at a used bookstore, I well fairly recently pre COVID, I picked up a copy of The Sea of the Sea. And I have not yet oh, yeah. read that one, but that's another one. Like you said, the Black Prince and the Sea are the two that, at least from my understanding, are are two of hers that everybody seems to think are the ones to go for. Yeah, the first one I read was the Sea, the Sea, and I loved it. I know not everybody does. It's mm-hmm. kind of one of those divisive books. It seems uh, some people just absolutely despise it, and maybe at a different time of life I would. But again, I remember uh, being on the train uh, to New York. Uh, and thinking, oh, to, let's start the sea, the sea, and getting fifty pages into it, and just thinking, wow, that time went fast. Yeah. And I'm just reading about this crotchety, despicable old man cooking potatoes, <laughs> and I'm like, and I loved it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it might be a glimpse of my future. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You'll love it too, <laughs> yeah, or exactly. hate it, I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, you're on your last one. What do What do you got there? Yeah. So my last one uh, might. Make you proud, given the name of your blog and podcast. So, uh-oh, Finnegan's uh-oh. Wake. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, I had read Dubliners, you know, years ago. Loved it. I read Portrait of an Artist in college, and I could. See, I was fascinated by it, but it was tough, and I don't think I was ready to read it yet. Mm-hmm. You know, so then last year, like I said, I'd get around to Ulysses and just had this amazing experience with it, and so. Even then, when I finished Ulysses, I was like, you know, realistically, I think probably I'm, you know, I'll reread all of these books, but I don't know that I'm ever going to go for Finnegan's Wake. It just seems like it's too much. Um, But I've just, it keeps kind of niggling at me. And then I've recently, you know, there's a couple people on social media who are big fans. They'll read through it over and over again. And there was one, I don't remember who it was. There was a lady who said the way that she had had the most success with it is almost treating it just like she was reading a song. And so I think it might, the way I mm-hmm. interpret that is more like going back to what I was saying earlier, where you just kind of let it wash over you and you don't try to get bogged down in all the details. So, you know, again, when am I going to do this? I don't know. But just after having finished Ulysses, and there are some of those chapters where, you know, I think there are some Finnegan's Wake-esque sections where, you know, it does get into some very surreal stream of consciousness stuff that you don't know exactly what is going on. Um I mean, they're beautiful. They're amazing. And so, you know, we'll see if I can withstand <laughs> hundreds of pages of that. But um, yeah, that one is one that if we're talking bucket list, I decided to swing for the fences and, and list that one. Well, there you go. There you go. I've never read it all the way through. I have read a lot of pieces of it for school, mm-hmm. and that's where I learned about the mooks and the gripes mm-hmm. um, originally. But I've never, never gone back. And, and I... Um, but I, I always did enjoy it. I think you're right that approaching it as a song and letting it wash over you, I, I think that's how it works. I mean, yeah. it's like a, it's more of an experience than pure, you know, knowledge that comes step by step. You know, it's right. like it's it's a 
it's it's a river you know it's something mm-hmm. that you you well that river run and all that yeah, you know, right. from, from it so uh yeah that that's i i do love it even though yeah. i've never read it uh, right of course you know part of my homage to it is that sense of of loving something that you that i guess i've never quite uh, uh mastered or even fully uh, grappled with <laughs> yeah no i mean there's i th- that definitely appeals to me that whole idea of just grappling with with books not all the time but and i'll just quickly add you know i know that we're running out on time here but um one of the things that i found with ulysses that really worked for me and a friend of mine actually suggested it was I listened to the Jim Norton audio Mm -hmm. book while I was reading. So I was reading and listening to him at the same time. For one thing, that is just a masterful performance by him. It is amazing. But one thing that it did do in addition to just, you know, he, he sings songs, he tells the poetry, he has the wonderful accents and everything, but just, I think that made me understand how you could just let it flow over you because if you don't push pause, it just keeps going. And as I was reading along, you know, I, I started to realize, you know, just go with it. And, and so anyway, if anybody is struggling with one with a book like that, that's one thing that I would suggest trying it because um, it really worked well for me. And Jim Norton, I think, is a very unique like he's a master. That, that was amazing. But I think that could probably work in other ways as well. And isn't that available somewhere on the Internet, like um, chapter yeah. by chapter? It probably uh, as a, is as a free a free download, even I. Yeah. If it is, um, I, I would encourage everybody to snap snap it up immediately. I think what I had done back before I had really gone anti-Amazon, you know, like this is probably 10 or 15 years ago. I think I had signed up for the free Audible where you get like one mm-hmm. free download and I had done that and then unsubscribed basically. Um, mm-hmm. And so I've just kind of had it floating around on my phone and on my devices for years now. And when I decided to go for it, you know, I remembered I had that and like I said, it was an amazing experience. So one of, one of those readers' experiences. Absolutely, right? for sure. <laughs> awesome. Well, mine's quite different. Um, you, you're swinging for the fences with your last uh, choice here, and, and I'm looking at something that I think I could read in just a day or two, mm-hmm. and it's Antonia White's Frost in May. And I'll tell you why I picked this one. I don't know very much about it. I know enough that it's, you know, I know some of its content. I know it's part of a bigger kind of series of work. It's, it's that title. You know, mm-hmm. there's some books that just call to you because of their title. And I don't know if I'll like it. I don't know a whole lot about it, but it's been on my shelf forever because of its title. And I almost don't dare read it because I'm like, it can't be as good as it's what its title does to me. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what its title um, has resonate uh, with me, but, but I know a lot of people do like it. So I have, I have hopes, but that's, that's one that I, I have plans to read fairly soon. I, I, I have had the copy for a long time and I've, I've decided that, you know, here shortly, uh, it's time to get into Frost in May and um, start getting through some of these books that have, have called to me through the years because there's some, you know, we're on this, we're on some kind of wavelength or, or just resonates with me. Mm-hmm. And I may be, again, completely wrong. But there are books like that, and I thought it might be nice to have a representative uh, here uh, of those those ones that no one talks about a ton. You know, I hear about it right. quite, you know, relatively often, I guess. But um, you know, they're they're just those ones that you think, oh, that that's a special a special title, mm-hmm. guaranteed. I'm going to be talking about this book for all my life, but I haven't read it yet. <laughs> right? No, I mean that's one of the magical things about having like I love having books around and sometimes mm-hmm. there are those ones like you said it may not even be based on logic and often it isn't but they just kind of call to you and haunt you over the years and I have to admit I'm going to be googling that one right after we're done here cuz you you actually got one that I have not even heard of so Oh okay yeah the uh, check it out Frost in May Antonia White okay and there we have it. I mean, yeah. and I, I like your point there too of having books around because as a kid we had bookshelves, and mm-hmm. I was too young to know or, or to you know start reading some of them. But they they would they would like call to me. There's a world of possibilities there. Um, I do use you know an e reader for for a lot of stuff now. I find it mm-hmm. very convenient, especially with review copies and whatnot. But um, but I I never want to get rid of bookshelves because I have kids, you know, and I yeah. have my own self to, to look at something and see, see worlds just within a, you know, a cover. And, Absolutely. And no, it's funny you say that. Possibilities. My boys, um, I have a copy of Con- a Confederacy of Dunces on my shelf and it's, I think it was Penguin. <laughs> Did they put out the kind of the cartoony covers and there's this little yellow bird 
that's sitting on the spine, a little cartoon yellow bird. And my kids have been fascinated with that book since the time they were toddlers. <laughs> and it continues to this day. So that whole idea, like you said, of <laughs> they, they probably don't even have any clue what it's about, but just having those books around and it captures their imagination, you know, and just calls calls to them over the years too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that just reminds me, my, my kids uh, watch Animaniacs mm-hmm. and they talk about Citizen Kaney, you know, as part of the, <laughs> the, the song. Well, I have a, one of those big, you know, thick box sets of Citizen Kane. Mm-hmm. And one day I walk downstairs and they're sitting there looking at it. <laughs> wow. Look at that. There's Citizen Kaney. <laughs> That's funny. And I thought they haven't seen that yet. And maybe right. they don't care, but part of them, I think, is wonders and and Absolutely. has that 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 view out there. Well, and they're making well, those connections. Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, somewhat skewed, but right. in, in the right way, I think. I'll, I'll I support them getting their their classic cinema from Animaniacs. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I have some some honorable mentions, and I know you do too. Um, I put I. I Portrait of a Lady by Henry James, mm-hmm. uh, Mason and Dixon, Thomas Pynchon's is one. Oh, yeah. um, I've never read anything by Anthony Trollope, and I didn't know which one to put on here, so I just put him in my honorable mentions as a person, mm-hmm. <laughs> as yeah. an author. Yeah, no, I did a few of those too. Um, and May Sarton, because of a lot of you guys. Yeah. And one that I think will make you proud, because I'm going to get to it, it's David Copperfield, ah, Charles Dickens. Yes, that warms my heart. <laughs> you've as been, you know, I'm a I, huge, I finally, huge fan. I bought it. I bought it because of you. So yeah. now I just need to read it too. <laughs> well, speaking of, of good parental influences, you talked about your parents sending you some great books. My mom, um, that's her favorite book of all time. And she actually reads mm-hmm. it once a year. Oh, wow. And so I think for me, part of it is probably nostalgia and just, you know, associating that with good childhood memories, but it's just a great book. It's, it's just everything that's great about Dickens. So yeah, I look forward to hearing what you think of that one. I'm excited. Now, one that is not an honorable mention and not on my list, but I thought it was worth putting up because there are some of these books that have been on my bucket list for years and I finally struck them off. And one, War and Peace. Mm. I've tried that thing five or six times, get 100 pages into it and realize I don't know and I don't care. Mm -hmm. Even though I think that the story is great. I've seen the the old, um, you know, 60s uh, uh, Russian uh, series movie. I love it. Yeah. I just can't read the dang thing. And so I've said, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm fine with that. Are there any, yeah. it, well, let's get to your honorable mentions. And then I am curious if there are any books that you finally said, you know, what? I'm retiring that from the bucket list. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to think as I'm going through my list here. Yeah. Right. So, um, do you know John McPhee at all? I know the name. I don't, yeah. I don't think just I've read when you, anything. When you were talking about nature writing earlier, that's one that, mm-hmm. um, annals of the former world. It's, it's a real deep, geological dive into different parts of the country. But I guess my understanding is he's an English professor, so it's very literary and and just beautiful writing. So that one's on my list. Speaking of the Russians, Brothers Karamazov is on my list. I've read and loved Crime and Punishment, but that one I have not gotten to yet. One of my beautiful experiences. Oh, nice. Yeah. Reading that one. Yeah. Um, Short stories of Flannery O'Connor. Again, as an English major, I've, I've read bits and pieces, bits and bobs, but I have a friend who... Um, grew up in the South um, in Mississippi and and he is always just telling me you got to read her stuff. So um, she's on there too. Um, you know, I, I have a huge list here, but I'll just skip through a couple more. Um, Krasna Horkai. I know that you're a big oh, fan uh-huh. of his. I've, I've read a couple of his minor works, but one of these days I need to just dig in with Satan Tango and just start making my way, you know, through that list. So that one is definitely very high on my list. Um, and then, you know, I'll stop. But the one other one that has kind of a more recent addition to my list of things I'd like to read is Willop T. Volman. I've seen him coming up more and more lately, and mm-hmm. he was always one I kind of wrote off. And I still am not sure that he's going to be for me. But um, I have one called, um, I think it's called Prairie Grass, about the Nens Pierce tribe. And that one in particular, but just that whole series, there's something very fascinating to me about somebody who takes that much time to write books that are without that well researched. So those are kind yeah. of some of the few, I mean, in future episodes, maybe we can touch on more because I have about a billion here. Um, <laughs> I better live to I be about so. 200. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, that sounds good. Well, that's fun. Um, and and I'll, I'll follow up with you to see if there are any that you retired from your bucket list. You don't have to come up with any right now. <laughs> There's one that's, I don't know if I'm quite, I wouldn't say it's retired yet, but I'm starting to think it might not happen. And that is, um, Oh, no, uh, Infinite Jest. I oh, yeah. I love David Foster Wallace's essays. 
I go back and forth on that one. I just, the people who love it, I told you how I'm susceptible to kind of excitement and hype and passion. And the people who love that book have all of those things in spades. <laughs> and so I'll read one of those threads or, or read a blog about somebody <laughs> who loved it. And I'll just be like, okay, I'm going to do it. And then I start to dig into like some of what it, they're actually saying about it. And I am just not sure that it would ever work for me. So I won't say I've retired it, but I would say, you know, it, it's probably going to be one that I will end up retiring one of these days. <laughs> I've never read it. And I, yeah. it's not one that I, and I do, I'm with you. I like his essays. I like his, I think he, and his short stories mm-hmm. um, quite, quite a bit, but I never been p- totally pulled into that one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and part of it's just the reputation of its readers. You know, you always see yep. uh, them being a little bit uh, made fun of for oh, Infinite Jest. You know, it's like the, the hipster book. Absolutely. I don't think that's fair to the book, but it does make it so I'm like, oh, well, that's probably, I'm not not sure that's for me then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But All right. Well, we were going to end the episode by doing maybe a recommendation for, mm-hmm. for, you know, beyond all the books we've talked about and are excited about. Um, what is a book that you would uh, recommend? Yeah. To well, actually, listening? if it's okay with you, I, I did not think it was only books. And so I'm actually going to go oh, in yeah, a slightly no. different direction if that's okay. Yeah, for um, sure. That said, I could go for a long time on just recommending books. We can save that for future episodes. But actually what I was going to recommend is there is this series on Netflix that my wife and I just discovered and it's called My Love. I don't know if you've seen this, but it is a series that follows uh, six couples around the world over a course of a year. Um, So there's, you know, the first couple we've seen, there was a couple that was in the U S and then the second one was in Spain. So there's four more episodes we haven't seen yet, but all of them have been together anywhere from like 40 to 60 years. Um, and so hmm. they're basically just sharing their stories. Um, and if I read that description, I might like fear that it was a little bit schmaltzy or a little bit like, I, I don't know if I would think that it would necessarily work for me, but it is just very wholesome and like, it's not schmaltzy at all. It, it, it like one of the episodes they're following them and they're, and they're doing their, some of their estate planning. And they were talking together about like, if I go first, if you go first, what are we going to do? And, and it's just very, pure and sweet and and also just like there's no narration or anything it's just little snippets of their lives and so it'll it's kind of seasonal it'll go through the four different seasons of one year and just check in with them and kind of just film them as they're doing different parts of their lives so i don't know it's just been a really nice series that we're watching Each, each episode's probably an hour or a little bit more so you know it's just something a little bit different that that we've really been enjoying so i thought i would just throw that out there Oh, I like that. I wrote it down for sure. Yeah. And yeah, we can recommend whatever whatever we want here at the end. Yeah. I did I did choose a book. Um, okay. Again, it, maybe it's like, oh, we've, we've done enough. But I think it's one that, that I just got it not too long ago in the mail from Archipelago. Mm-hmm. And I think that I saw that you got a copy too. It's the, let's see here. Oh, yeah. Everything Like Before, the stories of, and I don't know how to say this, but Kiel Eskildsen. Um, Norwegian uh, writer. This is a collection of short stories uh, translated by uh, Sean Kinsella. I am loving these stories. They have a lot going on underneath the words. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, archipelago books are so beautifully produced Uh, that they're fairly short. A lot of these are, you know, I I think there's like 38 stories and it's 300 pages long or something like that. So there's there, a lot of them are very short, but there there's a resonance there. It's not, it's not necessarily happy stuff. Um, it's not that kind of uh, depth and stuff going on beneath the, the pages. It's uh, it's fairly lonely or even a little bit bitter sometimes. And, um, but yeah, kind of a volume I'm, I'm, I'm currently going through it and, um, thought I would recommend it to people because I, I worry that it might just get passed over yeah. as a, uh, another, another book that came in, came out and is now in the back catalog, but it's, it's worth picking up. Yeah. That one really appeals to me when they sent out their catalog, you know, I don't know if it was their fall catalog or winter, I don't remember, but there were a couple of books that really stood out to me out of that catalog that I circled. And that was absolutely one of them. So I'm glad to hear you're enjoying it. And I, I yeah. plan on reading that one probably soon, maybe within the next month or so. And I think it works. It's a, it's a one of those bedside books for me. I yeah. read a story or two every you know evening, and and that's just been been something I've 
looking forward to, you know, it's not just like, Oh, time to read that story. It's like, Oh, oh excited to read that tonight, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, um, all right, well, there we go. Our half hour show has turned into a little bit longer than that. We'll, we'll work on things to, right. to figure out exactly how we're going to, to settle in. We'll do whatever, we'll do whatever we want, whatever works for us for sure. And hopefully it's, um, in a way that, that others can engage with us. Cause that's really what this is all about. You know, we, we I don't think that, you know, the, the goal here is to, take over the podcasting world so much as just connect again. It's so much fun. So I appreciate it, Paul. Yeah, me too. It's been great. And like I said, I think uh, a decade plus of conversations, you know, coming, coming to fruition here. It's no wonder we went over (laughs) our time. So yeah, it's been great. (laughs) All right. Well, with that listeners, we'll, we, we're planning on doing this periodically every couple of weeks or so. Um, So we will, we will get some more of these in the can and, and get them on some kind of schedule. Uh, different topics, you know, different things. If you have ideas, let us know. But we look forward to engaging with you. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mooks and the Gripes podcast. You can follow the Mooks and the Gripes and get show notes and book and film reviews at mooksandgripes.com. On Twitter, you can follow Trevor at Mooks and Paul at BiblioPaul. You can also get information about future shows on our Patreon. If you'd like to donate to the show, anything and everything, even a dollar a month helps and is deeply appreciated, you can become a Patreon at patreon.com mooks. Until next time. <laughs>